honor of introducing Mary Rose Weatherton, a second year PhD, a PhD student in Beth Schuster's lab. She began her academic career at Marquette University in Wisconsin and even spent some time at Duke as a visiting student in their marine sciences lab. She is no fish out of water when it comes to research and she found her roots working in, with the Smithsonian examining plant competition in tropical forests. However, her research interests have shifted over time to revolve around the central theme of education and digs deeper into student perception of success and resource use. Mary Rose's passion for her research stems from her extensive teaching and outreach from local urban ecology centers, the Knoxville Zoo, and even coordinating and volunteering various uh, mentoring and education communities. This dedication to teaching and mentoring has owned her skills and work ethic which she used to earn, and I really do mean her because she worked her butt off to earn the National Science Foundation's Graduate Research Fellowship. So quick round of applause for that. Um, when she's taking a break from being dangerously caffeinated, working on her research at Starbucks, you can find her at your local climbing gym, hanging out with her villagers at Animal Crossing, or at the dog park with her adorable dogs, Bug and Poppy, who make a guest appearance in her talk titled, What's in a Word? Exploring Graduate Student Definitions of Success. Mary Rose, over to you. Thank you, Eric, for your lovely introduction. Um, thank you guys also for your nice round of applause. That's nice that you guys all did that. Um, so I will get right into it. But before I start, I want to acknowledge um, everyone who has helped me do this research so far. So that is my lab, which is Dr. Beth Schusler and Caroline Weinhold and Hope Ferguson. I also want to thank the second and fourth year seminar group who gave me great feedback on my talk. And then finally, I want to thank all of the UTK graduate students that volunteered for this project and all of the pilot studies that I've done so far. I definitely could not have done any of this without everybody's participation. So I really appreciate it. So my talk today is going to be divided into four main components. So we'll start by discussing some of the biggest issues within higher education. I'll tell you how those are all connected to success. We'll explore how graduate students define the concept. And finally, we'll talk about what it means for mentors, department heads, and everybody else. So some of the biggest issues within graduate education today revolve around student perceptions of their PhD experience, specifically the dual crises of poor mental health and high attrition from graduate programs. Recent studies have found that graduate students are six times more likely than the general population to experience depression or anxiety. Poor mental well-being can cascade into a host of other issues, including poor academic achievement within and high attrition from their graduate programs. A recent review of the literature by Spetterlich and colleagues has shown the many factors that have been proposed to influence student experiences within higher education, as shown here in a table adapted from Spetterlich et al. 2018. The most commonly studied factor was student supervision, followed by motivation and departmental support. However, one unstudied factor that underlies all of these components is how graduate students conceptualize and define success within their programs. For example, if graduate students define success in a different way from their advisor, that relationship may become difficult as time goes on. Similarly, student definitions of success are at the core of their goals and overall motivations for continuing on in academia. In my most recent publication, I've argued that the way that success is defined impacts every aspect of education, from research to policy to student outcomes, as seen in this conceptual figure. So, for example, let's say that we define success as doing well academically. It follows then that we would measure success via grades, exam scores, or perhaps scores on the GRE. And we can see how this example on the right would map onto our conceptual figure on the left. These metrics then influence who is seen as successful and thus affect policies that select certain graduate students for admission into a program. The issue is hopefully very apparent here, as recent research has shown that GRE scores are mostly predictive of socioeconomic status, not student success, which is why our department has recently removed GRE requirements for incoming graduate students, as they often lead to inequity within graduate school admissions. Now, that's a pretty obvious definition, or sorry, a pretty obvious example of how a definition of success can lead to inequality. However, leaving success undefined is equally problematic if definitions of success are unclear or are variable. Graduate students may feel unsupported or confused if these definitions are not stated outright. And we can see that the issue of undefined success is common within the academic literature. 
In our recent literature review, we found that the majority of papers related to student success did not explicitly define the term at all, but instead implicitly defined success via how they were measuring it. Furthermore, we found that only 2% of papers we examined asked students to define success for themselves. And this, of course, is an issue if students have different definitions of success than those that are present in the literature. And here on the right hand side, in a quote from one of our study participants, we can see that students are aware of and frustrated by this discrepancy, with student H saying that their success is defined by the academic establishment, not by themselves. So student voice is obviously missing from the literature. And so for the first chapter of my dissertation, I set out to fill this gap. Specifically, I had two research questions. How do graduate students in a life sciences program define success? And how do these definitions align with what we're seeing in the literature? To answer these questions, I performed qualitative interviews with 10 graduate students at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Interviews lasted roughly an hour each and covered graduate students' PhD experience, definitions of success, and how those definitions of success changed over time. These interviews were transcribed and I used interpretive phenomenological analysis to find broad themes within participants' responses. Now, I know most folks in the audience are not necessarily familiar with qualitative work. So before we discuss my results, I'll just briefly go over how I get those results. And as I said before, interview transcripts were analyzed using interpretive phenomenological analysis, which is a method of breaking down participants' experiences into codes and themes. And very broadly, we can think about the process of sorting codes and themes in a similar manner to the way that biologists use systematics, where codes are names for single pieces of data. In my work, these data points are usually phrases or segments of an interview, but here our codes are different animals. And we can see here that we have seven pieces of data, but only six codes since we have two salamanders. This is, it's common in both systematics and qualitative analysis to have multiple data points like animals or phrases within an interview be represented by the same code. And so themes are ways that we can group our codes. These themes are informed by the literature and the analyst knowledge of the population. So we could, for example, sort our codes into two themes, amphibians on the left and mammals on the right. Though as analysis goes on and more information is gleaned from the data, themes can shift. So if, for example, I learned that my dog Bug likes to roll in dead things, I may change these themes to better represent some other aspect of these animals, like slimy things on the left and soft and cuddly things on the right. So now that we're clear on that, let's talk about my results. Here on the right hand side, we can see a representation of my codes and the one theme that they're all categorized under. I found seven codes within the interview that related to participants' definitions of success. So just like frogs and salamanders are both types of amphibians, resilience and gaining skills are both types of student-defined success. The codes I discovered in my interviews ranged from standard academic and career definitions to more unique definitions like resilience and making choices that are aligned with personal values. So here we have a semicircle chart that shows these codes mapped onto our participants, where each slice of the circle represents a participant one through 10, and each concentrically bound region represents one of our seven codes. Dots represent that our participants' definition of success included that code. So what we can see in this figure is that no two graduate students have the exact same definition of success, nor is there one code that is present in all participants' definitions of success. And we can look at these at three different participants to get a sense of this diversity. Participant one had five different aspects within their definitions of success. Everything from academic and career success to having a life that's aligned with their values and finding happiness. Participant five is more of what we might think of as the standard definition of success with solely academic and career success found within their definition. And finally, participant eight doesn't even mention academic success at all. Instead, most of their definition focuses around achieving goals, gaining skills, and becoming resilient in the face of change. So our first big takeaway here is that students have multiple diverse definitions of success. So to address our second research question, we can compare our interview results with the definitions of success found in our literature review. These definitions are the four big categories that represented how success was defined in the 40% of papers that did define success within our literature review that we talked about earlier. So we can see here in the literature, we're talking about persistence, 
academic success, career success, and social. And what we can see is while there's some alignment in academic and career definitions of success between the literature and what our graduate students are saying, there are many types of success that graduate students identify with that are not present in the literature at all. So we see major misalignments at this level. And while I didn't set out to explore misalignments at the department level, this idea came up multiple times in my interviews. We can see from this quote that there is at least some perception of a misalignment between students' definitions of success and how success is being broadcast by the department. Here we can see that this participant feels that success within their department is measured by unrealistic standards. So overall, in response to my first research question, I found that graduate students have multiple diverse definitions of success. And in response to my second research question, I found that there are major misalignments between graduate students' definitions of success and those present in the literature, with some perception of additional misalignments at the department level. So what do these results mean? If you'll remember how we started this presentation, I hypothesized that definitions of success might have cascading impacts on student mental health and well-being. My data suggests that misalignments in definitions are related to a low sense of belonging in our students. In my interviews, I identified three codes, PhD as a struggle, the perception of being an outsider, and not wanting to continue on in R1 research that made up an overarching theme of a lack of a sense of belonging. And this theme was present in every single interview, regardless of how participants define success. And we can see in these quotes that participants didn't always feel at home in the department, they didn't feel like they fit in. Student A says that they don't necessarily consider themselves as an ecologist since they don't fit in with their department. And student D says that they're struggling because they don't have anyone within the department or at UT to talk to. So now that we know how these misalignments might be affecting our students, let's talk about what we can do to help. Specifically, I'm posing recommendations to address the misalignments I've identified as well as their downstream effects on student well-being. The model shown here is adapted from Article 12 of the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child, and it delineates two key student rights that must be present to make academia more equitable, the right to be heard and the right to have views given due weight. And these rights can further be broken down into four components, space, voice, audience, and influence. In essence, academia must have space for students to express their views and their opinions should be legitimately addressed, not just tokenized. And so using these components to guide our thinking and practice, we can avoid student feelings of frustration or an inability to affect change, as is currently present. We can see that that's expressed by this student quote to the right, where student E says that there's a system put in place that works against what students want to pursue. So following this model, I'm proposing four key recommendations for departmental faculty and leaders going forward. The first is to normalize diverse definitions of success. So space is made for non-traditional definitions to be discussed. This might look like talking with students and mentees about how you define success and how that definition may have changed over time. The next suggestion turns the conversation around. Students should also be asked how they define success and how these definitions have impacted their PhD experience so far. Embracing the diversity found within our definitions of success will cultivate better outcomes within our department and within academia broadly down the line. The third suggestion is to empower students to speak up and make change. We must build a culture within the department and within academia broadly that allows students to feel empowered to speak up and propose change so that they can achieve their own definitions of success. And finally, departmental leaders and policymakers should appreciate students as partners in their policymaking decisions. One of the biggest insights that my research has shown so far is that our students have novel views of the graduate student experience, not necessarily captured by the literature or by departmental leaders. And thus, they should be included in policy discussions so they can lend these unique perspectives. So now that I know how students are defining success, the next phase of my research is focused on how students use resources to achieve success within their graduate programs. In the second and third chapters of my dissertation, I'll be exploring what resources graduate students use how resource use may be related to student characteristics and outcomes, and whether the perception of resources may act as a filtering agent within higher education. And with that, I will say thank you and ask if there are any questions. Thanks, Mary Rose. Really nice talk.
Lots of food for thought. Uh -huh. Susan, Susan has a great question in the chat. She says, were your data collected pre or post COVID? That's a really good question. They were collected this fall. So right in the middle of COVID. Yeah, which is certainly a limitation within my data, um, but also might be might lend us a really important point of view um, for what graduate student experiences might look like if we do decide to keep going virtual or hybrid or whatever, if we don't have that face to face component. So good question, Susan. Um, can I, uh, can I, can I, sorry. Go ahead, Brian. Go ahead. I don't want to jump, jump, jump to Q. Um, <laughs> do you have a sense of what the expected fraction of successful students should be according to the students, right? So you can, so like, for example, if one measure of success is, you know, the science papers and the outreach and stuff, not everyone will hit that. If one definition of success is graduating with an intended degree, more should hit that. And so depending on what you think of as like, being the best according to someone's definition or being, you know, doing what you need to do to be successful, where are students' definition of success on that spectrum? So I think what I'm hearing you asking is, do students have a perception of how many students should be successful? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, in terms of like what success is. Like success is like, I'm doing what, I'm, what makes me happy mm -hmm. or success is being the best at blah, right? And so the latter makes, makes a, a tinier definition. Yeah. So that is not something that I asked in our interviews and I like really don't have any idea of what students might say. Um, I, I think that it would probably be dependent on how they define success, right? Like maybe if you define success as just being resilient and making choices that are aligned with your values, maybe you think then that 90% of students should be successful. Um, but I'm not really sure. That's a good question. Thanks, Brian. Shannon's got her hand up. You're still muted, Shannon. Hi. <laughs> hey. Um, great, great talk. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you had considered um, or thought about like aligning some type of sentiment analysis with the um, number of categories that the interviewees like define success by. So, like, I guess I was thinking like maybe if this the individual student define success in like 10 of the different categories, maybe they have a more negative sort of sentiment about grad school and use, you know, maybe they use words in their interviews that are more negative or. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a really, really good idea. Um, so we are still in the middle of, Beth and I are still in the middle of doing analysis on these data. Um, but this idea of like students having more definitions, like maybe if they have more diverse definitions, they've got a more negative experience of graduate school is a really interesting hypothesis to look at because we do have a lot of codes that we're finding in the data so far that are these really negative perceptions of graduate school or of academia generally. So that would be something that we definitely have data on. So it'd be really interesting to look at. Thanks for the suggestion. So Mary Rose, there's clearly a lot of variation across departments across the, the country and across the globe about how graduate education is done. Are there kind of best practices out there or departments that you feel like are doing these things really well that we could look to as models? That's a really good question. Um, I definitely think that the concept of looking at other department heads and what other department heads are doing to improve our graduate students experience is kind of antithetical to what I'm to what my results say. And that instead of looking for other departments that are doing something great and what other researchers or you know department heads are thinking, we should instead just ask our graduate students what they want. Because just like you said, there's lots of variation across the country and you know across departments our graduate students are really likely to have unique goals and unique definitions of success that are unique to being at our school. And so if we want to improve our own graduate program, we should just ask our own graduate students. Good question. But, that, but, that's, going to, but that's going to change from year to year, right? So the, 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 the definitions of success are going to change from year to year. So the department would have to then shift how we do things every year. Yeah. I. I would say that they're probably going to change within some amount, like, you know, when I do interviews, I reach saturation at some point. So there's <laughs> you know, some point where everybody will be accounted for to some extent. Um, but you're right that it is probably going to change every year, which is why I'm a really big advocate for having like really flexible and open definitions of success within a department. Great, thank you. Mona has a question in the chat. 
Uh, can you remind me what the sample size was and if the students interviewed belonged to different departments? Yep. So I interviewed 10 students um, within qualitative research. That is a pretty large sample size just because these interviews are an hour long and they take like four hours to transcribe for every hour of interview. Um, so it is quite a limited sample size, but all of these um, participants were from one department. Um, so it's I don't have a very diverse sample size so far, but chapters two and three are looking to do nationwide surveys. So good question. And Sophia's got a question in the chat. Or sorry, got her hand up. Go ahead, Sophia. It's not in the chat. Nope. <laughs> you can look, but you won't find it there. Um, great talk. Um, I was just wondering, so I've noticed with myself that um, during, as you kind of go through the years of graduate school, your idea of what you're doing and whether you're successful at it or not changes over time. Um, are you going to resurvey the same people again, or have you considered looking at like people at different stages? Yeah, really, really good question. So that's actually something I did look at in this study. So I've got two different age groups of participants that I looked at. For this talk, I just pulled them all together. Um, but something I'm really interested at looking at is how demographic factors or previous experiences may be impacting students' definitions of success. And within these interviews, I actually asked participants if they thought their definition had changed over time since they started in their program or since their undergrad. And actually what we find is super interesting so far. Um, what I've seen is that students really tend to move when they start their graduate programs. They have a really external definition of success. So they're comparing themselves to other students, to you know what past you know, professors or whatever have been successful as. And as they move forward and oftentimes face, you know, struggles in their PhD, they have failures in their field seasons or whatever, they move to a more internal definition of success where they're saying success for me is just success for me. I don't have to compare to anyone else. Mostly I just need to have things where I feel really good about how I'm doing, um, which is really interesting. And I'm really looking forward to doing more um, analysis about that kind of stuff. Good question, Sophia. All right, we got two more questions in the chat and then we better wrap up. Uh, obviously, uh, people are excited about your work, Mary Rose. So Lucas asks, is there any research asking the definition of success for professors? Are those definitions in alignment with students' definitions of success? Good question, Lucas. Um, these, so yes, there is research that looks at professors. This is also quite a limited sample size. Um, but Susan Gardner, if you're interested, um, she's now a Dean at Oregon State University, but she used to be a faculty member at the University of Maine. She also spoke here this sem or last semester. Um, she did look at faculty members' definitions of success and how they thought about how students should be successful. And they are mostly, I would say between the two things that I've looked at so far, they're mostly similar to literature definitions of success where oftentimes faculty members are focused on getting papers published, getting students ready for their careers, which makes sense, right? Because that's kind of our faculty members' jobs. Um, but that did vary by domain and by you know the age of a faculty member and so on. So um, they are not necessarily in alignment with what I've found um, in student definitions of success. Yeah, thanks for your question. And then- Devin, I see your question in here. Am I planning on surveying just PhD students or master's students as well? Um, so in this chapter, I just surveyed PhD students, but in my second and third chapter where I'm interested in resource use, I'll be looking at both PhD and master's students. 